On today's Survival Dispatch podcast, we're going to talk about becoming the gray man. All right, guys, we're back with uh, my friend Sal De Janeiro, uh, self-defense and concealed carry expert. And today, as you saw in the opening, we're talking about becoming the gray man. Sal, welcome back to the podcast. Denny, thanks for having me back. You bet, man. There's a lot. This is a very, very uh, time worthy topic, isn't it? With with all the craziness that's going on in the world, the protests, all these large gatherings, and sometimes they pop up unexpectedly. And let's talk about becoming a gray man. First off, define the term gray man for us. So that term gets thrown around a lot in the preparedness community, in the self-defense community. Really, what it refers to is simply blending into your environment without drawing undue attention to yourself within reason, of course, right? We, we can't change our ethnicity or skin color or things like that, but certainly we can uh, dress the look of the environment that we're in. We can behave like the environment that we're in. So that's generally what the gray man concept refers to. And it's an important part of maintaining personal security, either domestically or abroad. So as you saw in the, the little opening, I had my had my mask on, I had my hoodie up, had my sunglasses on. I'll just kind of kind of re-portray this. That looks pretty good, but when you take my here's how unprepared I am for becoming a gray man. When you take the sunglasses and the mask off and the hat off, I've got I've got the mag pull. My Harley hoodie is the closest thing I have to a basic nondescript hoodie. And maybe I'm not so very well prepared at becoming the gray man. But tell me about that clothing wise. I know we're going to discuss these different categories of gray man situations, but kind of analyze me and let's talk about that. Well, you you point out something interesting wearing, for example, the Magpul hat, right? So being gray in any environment depends on the environment. I would submit that if you wanted to be the gray man at the uh, SHOT show or the NRA show, <laughs> then Good the Magpul point. hat is absolutely gray, correct? Uh, yes. In most environments, though, as probably all our viewers realize, that a- any kind of uh, logos for gun companies, weapons companies, training facilities, etc., the public may not necessarily know who that is. But you will find that very often the people specifically who you don't want to attract their attention, they will know what that is is right so yeah. so typically we want to avoid those kind of slogans logos etc right uh you guys can't see i'm just wearing a pair of uh, range pants on the bottom but i did some research you can go you can go to any little hardware store buy a pair of black gloves this is literally a dollar general ten dollar jacket this is a walmart uh, pair of sweatpants for 10 bucks these are a pair of black range pants from again from walmart for about 20 uh, something buck, 22, 23 bucks, black cargo pants. So I, I know where there's a, where there's a will, there's a way without spending a bunch of money. Am I right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, uh, nondescript clothing. Again, uh, it's going to depend on the environment that you plan to be in. For example, even the Harley Davidson hoodie, most environments within the continental United States, you'll be just fine with such a thing, but consider that entirely. Uh, if that indicates that you're a Harley Davidson fan, what else may that indicate, Denny. You know, our, might our, indicate that I'm a proud American, and <laughs> I like, and, and that you probably you, know, that you may you may have enough money to actually own a Harley, right? So those kind Good of point, things yeah. have to have to factor in, right? Harleys are not exactly cheap. Anything that we portray about ourselves can be used against us, depending on the environment, and those kind of determinations should factor in, especially when you travel domestically or internationally. Typically, when we're in our own environment, people just to naturally know the pulse of their own environment, right? Uh, what right. what stands out, what does not. Generally, we're the product of our own de- environment. But as soon as we deviate from that, these are all the kind of things you want to take into account. That's a really good uh, point there. Pretty, much, I'm, I'm thinking, in my mind, I think all black, all black, just bland, black, dark grays, stuff like that. But that's not necessarily always the case, as you have pointed out. And I would like to, I'm going to go analog again here, and I'm going to show a, a couple of videos Uh, of some recent large gatherings, protests, rallies, whatever you want to call them. Uh, Let's just take a look at these videos and let's analyze them from this becoming the gray man topic where I'm going to swing around here, show you what I've got on my 
computer screen. And I believe this one's in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And let's just watch this together. So pro-Palestinian flags, you can see they are chanting. I've got the volume down, but they're chanting. But I see lots of different colors. I don't see all black. I don't see all black hoodies. I don't see people really trying to blend in. I'm going to play that one more time and show that to you. So you can see as the camera pans this way, we've got people with all, all kinds of clothing, all kinds of colors. It's a cold environment up there. I believe that's in Minnesota. But you don't necessarily have to go all black uh, to blend in in a situation. Uh, and there's an example, for instance, right? Well, yes, yeah, sure. So so this is a domestic protest where it's just common people coming out to a given protest, right? So right. The, the dress is not distinctly anything. I, I'm trying to think in terms of a protest in the past that we've seen where there might be more of a dress code. I, I'm, I'm sure there have been those things. Um, if, if, if you're in an environment where you're likely to see something like that, I would submit that certainly it should factor into your the way you're dressing because you wouldn't want to stand out if you're caught up in a crowd protests like what we've seen lately are just people dressed in typical civilian clothing so you're you're going to blend right in as long as you're not wearing anything that's an anomaly compared to that baseline that's a good point here and i want to show another uh, pro-palestine uh, march here and talk about one specific detail that i've noticed this is in uh, washington dc and as you can see we've got people we've got a lot of shamogs and middle eastern bits and pieces of garb that people are wearing in this video that kind of identify them as being not necessarily Palestinians. Well, actually, that is a Palestinian design, I believe, there, but at least Middle Eastern. So that would be another way to blend in in this type of situation, right? Absolutely, right? So if if that is um, something that is um, endemic to the particular movement, if you, uh, whether you're involved in whatever the, the protest is or not, I, I presume most of your uh, audience is not big on joining joining protest. I certainly am not. Right. So <laughs> no, so, matter of fact, uh, we encourage, we encourage yes. people to avoid exactly that situation right. exactly altogether. Right. But there's an example of uh, 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 Shemag. Uh, of course, a lot of people love them because there's so there's so much utility where you can uh, keep dust out of your face, uh, even against, uh, well, I guess they're not so much help against tear gas or something. But a lot of people, a lot of our military guys really got into wearing those, right, when they spent time sure. in the desert. So if it's something that's useful anyway, there's a perfect example of pull it out of your pack and put it on you if you have to walk along with a crowd and you really don't want to stand out, right? So the those are just the sort of things to to bear in mind. But uh, again, it, it, it's going to, in, unless it's something that has a specific look, like the example you just showed, most protests of any kind are just going to be the civilian population congregating for something, right? And we know those big crowds often lend themselves to violence. So it's going to be usually more a matter of the environment, the location, the culture, more so than anything necessarily being donned for the particular movement. Right. Now let's talk about, I, I, I'm just going to ask you, how important is it to be gray man in just your average public place? If I'm going grocery shopping, if I am going to a restaurant, going to a, a public place where I don't really expect a large gathering or a protest, a rally, and I, and I don't really expect danger or something like that. Let's talk about becoming a, gro a, a gray man in those situations. And how, how important is it? Is it important? Yeah, absolutely. Your, your everyday life. So any environment is, uh, whether it's right around your home or in a different city, a different town, et cetera, it's still an environment that has, again, what we refer to as a baseline, right? What is the baseline of normal? So one Whenever you stand out from that baseline, it puts you on the radar for anybody who's observing that. And the criminal entity is always observing that. Right. So when you think of just being gray, even in your own environment, think about what you wear. Do you wear expensive clothing? Do you wear expensive watches? Do you wear expensive jewelry? Right. Yeah, so your this... accessories can really kind of absolutely give you away, so to speak. Right. Absolutely. And again, we, we, we talk so much about protests because, again, we're going through another bout of that. And, and it worries a lot of people, which it should. We should be concerned with those things. But this gray man principle certainly goes to your just everyday life. I'll, I'll mention a trend that we've seen a lot of lately concerning crime that is follow home robberies 
Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Where, where people are spotted in public and then a, a group of men in a car, follow you home and, and rush you in your own parking lot and rush into your home, et cetera. Right. Well, if you walk around wearing a $5,000 Rolex or expensive jewelry in the case of women or $5,000 Armani suit, it is very clear that you are most likely a person of means, not necessarily, but typically the, uh, the criminals are going to associate that with, with people who have wealth, right? So these are the kind of things you want to bear in mind. And I would submit that you should consider that even if you're not spending time in the bad side of town, because from what we're seeing, even the more uh, luxuriant sides of big cities these days have gotten quite dangerous in this regard. So I I think uh, wearing things that make you stand out from the baseline in general is a bad idea. Now, very interesting there that you mentioned uh, things that set you apart as someone who has money or or an affluent person, somebody worth stealing from. And it really applies to the ladies. And we don't speak enough to the ladies. And I I probably should have invited one of my female self-defense folks on this talk too. Maybe we'll do that in the future and talk about that. But you're carrying your purse with this specific brand or, or logos on it that are easily identifiable as being very expensive. The Let's just face it, women tend to wear more jewelry than guys in some areas, I should say, some not, uh, which could identify them as having more money or people just are the crooks just wanting to steal that stuff. So lady, let's speak to the ladies a little bit uh, about that topic as well, Sal. Absolutely. Uh, Think of just the accessories that women carry compared to men. On average, obviously most women probably walk around with a lot more money's worth of clothing and accessories on their person than men do, right? So maybe carrying your $5,000 Gucci a handbag when you're in certain areas is probably not a good idea, right? We're, we're talking again about attracting the eye of the criminal entity, which even though we get worked up about protests, again, this is something that in our daily life we should be concerned about, whether there's protests going on or not. What is the criminal element looking for? And honestly, that plays into these crowds that we see as well. Who makes trouble in big protests? Usually it's criminal actors, right? So right. Uh, it, that is most often our concern unless we are specifically in environments that get exceptionally hostile. Think of uh, Portland, Oregon during the summer of 2020, right? Where things just got exceptionally violent. Uh, outside of those kind of locations, even if you have protests going on, usually the bad actors infiltrating are of the criminal element. You don't want to be walking around the street, whether it's filled with people or empty, with a $5,000 Gucci bag in a lot of places. I would submit most places. It's probably a bad idea. Now, by the way, for our listeners, a lot of this discussion, a lot of this information that you're hearing from Sal is coming from things he's written about, his books, his articles, and things like that. So we are going to post some links in there. You've written some fantastic U.S say carry articles about the gray man concept about traveling domestically and let's talk about internationally while we're while we're uh mentioned domestic uh things can be quite a bit different uh internationally than domestically i'm going to pan around i'm going to show you another video here in just a sec of a recent protest in the uk which looks a little different from our uh american scenarios and i want you to notice how deep this crowd is and how many look they look like they can barely move sal they are shoulder to shoulder they're occupying this every inch of this space this is also a pro-palestinian event i'm going to play it again it's just it really it's incredible to think why in the world first off would you want to put yourself in this kind of situation and secondly if you're caught in this situation involuntarily how do you blend in how do you get the heck out of something like this those those are the questions that i would ask mm-hmm. Yeah, the numbers of that one is shocking. I, I've heard it was like 300,000 people. It's uh, amazing that bridge didn't collapse with all the... It so, just blows my mind how, how you can... Why would you want to put yourself in that kind of situation? And and what's uh, what's amazing to me is how what is an international event here has apparently hit some kind of tipping point. 
probably has a lot to do with social media and what people see today, because as you well know, Denny, uh, this this thing has been going on for long before you and I were even born, or, yep. or most of the people in the audience, right? There's probably some who remember uh, uh, when it all kicked off, but it, it's very interesting how this particular thing is just bringing out the masses, and there's a lot of social reasons why. Uh, many people who are marching may well be invested in just that specific topic, but a lot of others, of course this is a a society thing where now a lot of it is pro west anti west etc and and again that brings us back to in these kind of big demonstrations it, it's not necessarily the people who are legitimately there for any given cause it's who right. else is there right uh, for example these have been filled with like the antifa types with uh oh. within domestically within the US anyway so and with, paid pr- and paid protests yes, professional absolutely. Paid protesters, Soros funded groups, uh, Soros uh, p- putting all these funds and money into these uh, uh, professional protesters. I just want to speak to that because when I first heard about that, I wondered about that. But I really think that's I really think that's happening. I think that's actually happening, that many of these protests are funded. I think there are a lot of prof- I wouldn't call them professional, but pro- professional uh, by definition, protesters and people participating in these events or money that may or may not agree with the topic that's of discussion. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Again, think of the Black Lives Matter protest in uh, 2020, right? So you had all kinds of people show up to those that could care less about whatever particular cause people are actually marching for, right? And uh, there's even confirmed reports of certain areas where pallets of bricks were laid there the night before, that sort of thing. So obviously there are there are the political entities within the United States. Very often, those are multi-billionaire entities that right. want to destabilize society. So whatever the cause is, so if it's a racial thing, if it's this international thing, they're going to throw their weight behind it to just try to destabilize society. And that is a perfect example of why we simply do not want to be in in uh, these causes. Uh, the, one, the one big rally I can think of that was quite peaceful was when 60,000 gun owners showed up to Richmond, Virginia uh, in in 2020, and uh, they left the city cleaner than it was on any <laughs> other day. So if it's those kind of folks, apparently you're pretty safe, but enough firepower in that city to take over the whole eastern seaboard and nobody was hurt, no property was damaged. Uh, that, to me, is an interesting indication of... Um, what sort of folks come to different kind of rallies, right? It seems that it seems that uh, those, those, gun loving uh who that the far left really hates they show up and all of that firepower and nothing bad happens right yeah. and it it it's it's the the kind of people who show up are are is it a is it a political movement that screams like a bunch of 2 year olds or is it people that are there for something serious and there could be a whole variety of issues that fall onto either side right yeah. so those are the also the kind of things you want to bear in mind if you're even considering being around something but i can tell you honestly no matter what the cause is i simply am not big on being caught in the middle of large crowds. yeah i want to give it even, a large birth yes even if it's something that you strongly believe mm-hmm. in uh it could still go bad and in the long run you're probably better off uh sh- showing your opinion with your vote mm-hmm. instead of showing up at, at one of these things you want to remind everybody you're watching the survival dispatch news podcast with our special guest sal de janeiro self-defense and concealed carry expert i'm denny chapman hit those buttons like subscribe comment and share and help our algorithm out so we just showed that video of the uh, people that were thousands, hundreds of thousands of people shoulder to shoulder in the UK. Let's talk about international considerations becoming that international gray man. You've, I've read your articles. I've, re- I've read your outlines on this. You, there's such a wealth. We could probably talk for hours on this, but let's be very specific and talk about traveling internationally, some considerations regarding clo- clothing and lug- for, luggage, for instance. What about what about your luggage? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I, I've traveled extensively internationally. I've uh, been uh, in Europe, uh, the Middle East, etc. So things you want to consider, first of all, is pretty much any country that's a foreign country that you, you would travel to is a significantly different culture, even throughout Europe. Right. So so the baseline is different as to what people 
consider normal behavior. Um, behavior itself may not vary that much. Even in cultures very unlike ours, most social interaction is pretty similar. But dress can be very different. Certain customs can be very different. Uh, things that are worn or carried often are very different. So you want to do some research before you travel. Are, are you going to spend time in Germany? Are you going to spend time in Saudi Arabia, right? It's it's all very different dress, some very different culture, uh, cultural norms. We cannot change the way we look, right? Now, the truth is the modern world, throughout Asia, throughout Europe, throughout the Americas, the modern world is so filled with expats on any, any given day that the need to blend in to look like the ethnicity of the native population is not so big a concern. We can't do that anyway, right? Right. But That's a great point, yeah. by the way. Right. Absolutely. Now, if there are certain places that are that are on high alert throughout the world where civil wars are happening, that kind of stuff, I would advise not spending time in those places unless you have <laughs> to be there uh, as military personnel or something. Right. But yeah. during during peacetime, right, even if you're going to places where the ethnicity, the local ethnicity looks very different than you, most places in the world just have a tremendous amount of tourists any any given day. Right. So yeah. the, the more important thing. Thing is we want to blend into the baseline so that we are not attracting attention to ourselves. And again, we want to consider what are the criminal actors in those environments looking for? If you go to certain places like uh, Middle Eastern countries, Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, a lot of people uh, do business there. They are so strict on crime that getting mugged in the street, there's a real low probability of that, right? Yeah, but that's a good point. There, even in places like that, there is always criminal actors, no matter where you go. Uh, Dubai, a very uh, affluent country, very strict on crime, but there's so many wealthy tourists there. There is indeed still a criminal entity that operates, right? So we, much of what you want to consider would be similar to what we were do talking about just in your own environment. Are you wearing flashy things that would attract attention? One big aspect of consideration for international travel is the luggage that you travel with. You, you mentioned luggage, and that's a big one. So remember that when you arrive to a destination, depending on where you're staying, you're going to be visible to people when you arrive. For example, a hotel lobby, right? You come with a cab or whatever transportation you're using to get to the hotel be aware that eyes are on you, right? There are most likely native people who work in that lobby. And even if none of them are nefarious, who else is hanging out around that location, right? So yeah. something very commonly that we'll see in um, domestic as well, certainly not just international, but it's more pronounced in a lot of uh, international destinations is people who work in that hotel will be on to tourists who look like they have money and you check in and you put your luggage in the hotel room and you go out and have a nice dinner and you come back and all your stuff is gone, right? Yeah, th those sort of uh, considerations. So you definitely don't want to be carrying uh, luggage that's multi-thousand dollar Gucci bags, right? Go with uh, your Samsonite stuff or, or whatever, <laughs> something robust, but that makes sense. That is more... a, little, a little more nondescript. Exactly. With, nondescript. Without the, the, lo the logos that scream, I spent a lot of money on this. Absolutely. <laughs> and so depending on where where you go in the world, uh, women with jewelry uh, can be a really bad idea. Again, it depends on where. Uh, yeah. Middle Eastern culture, it's very common for women to wear a lot of jewelry, right? Uh, even certain Asian cultures. In Europe, man, I would be really hesitant to walk around you know, certain places in Europe, if not all of Europe, wearing a lot of extravagant jewelry. So again, it just depends on the culture. And regardless of the culture, there is always criminal activity, whether you have more or less of it in, in any given place, right? So don't yeah. don't draw the attention to you in terms of obviously signifying the fact that you have money, right? Save that for, uh, again, that's so out, far outside of my social realm. I don't understand anybody who would wear <laughs> a $5,000 watch anyway, but I know there's enthusiasts into it, right? I'll wear that to the dinner party with, with oh, your friends or coworkers. Yeah. Or I have, I, I, I'm going to just tell you right now, 
I've got some buddies that I don't know how they, I, it's, I'm not, I've got my hundred dollar uh, G flex on, which serves yeah. me just fine. But I have some very good friends that I respect that have my, that share my you know, political ideals and my conservative nature that wear expensive watches. I have collections of watches and really not, and they look good at them too, mm-hmm. but we, but we just don't want to do that. We, uh, I get that. Now we've talked about clothing and perception as far as your image and what you look like, but what about habits and body language? That's a great point. Uh, and in fact, let me just touch on this. Uh, we'll, we'll give the the watch enthusiast a pass because it's an enthusiast thing, right? A lot of people are into expensive watches, but even a $300 G-Shock, depending on where you are, that can stand out as, hey, that is a prepared kind of guy. That's a military guy. That's whatever the case may be. Good point. G-Shock Good point. or other kind of brands, Garmin, et cetera, right? So yeah. just bear that in mind. So it's not necessarily uh, symbolizing that. That you have a lot of money, but it does symbolize that, hey, a guy who wears a G shirt. I like this and he, logo on yep, the hat. And, yep. and something on his hat. And what does he have in that pack? Well, if things are desperate, it might be something we want, right? Right. Just things. Yeah. That can be. So, oh, where where were we going? You had just uh, brought us to in another. Direction. Yeah, we were. So we were talking. Inter- we 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 started talking a little bit about domestic. Now we talk about international. Before we move on to our next point, I because you brought up a very important point. I love backpacks. I've got a lot of backpacks. I probably wouldn't want to wear something like this and not want to be noticed because this is one of my favorite um, Vertex t- Tiger Stripe uh, bags. This would very easily identify me as uh, as what. If you saw this, Sal, how would you, you're, how would you characterize me? If you saw you're this, you're probably prepared in some regard that there's probably stuff in that pack that are, that's going to be valuable. And it, it would be more valuable, the more desperate a situation potentially was where, where you were. Here is a little more nondescript pack. However, those of us who know what we're looking at quickly notice, what do you notice first thing when you see this? Molly, there's Molly. On Molly. It. It's, yeah. It's low profile Molly, but still people would know uh, what it is. So with that said, I absolutely do not travel uh, domestically or internationally with a bag with Molly on it because yep. numerous times I have been approached by people who ask if I'm military just yep. because of the Molly, Molly on the bag, where yep. unless you are active duty military shipping for military purposes, you probably don't want to be identified as That's military. That's correct. Good thing about backpacks is you can put body armor plates in them, even a nondescript. It doesn't have to even be a backpack. That has a specific compartment for it, a 10 by 12 or a 10 by, I think that's a 10 by 14 uh, made by Premier specifically designed for uh, backpatch, which are approximately that size. You can always put uh, one of those in there. We might as well talk about that a little bit and being prepared. We can be prepared while blending in by doing small things like that as well, right? Absolutely. Use any advantage that you have. Uh, I love the uh, the soft armor idea for backpacks. Uh, my daily sling bag that I always have in the vehicle or I'll carry if I'm actually out and about walking around. Uh, I have a uh, 10 by 12 panel in that that is only one and a quarter pounds and stops anything up to a 44 Magnum can defeat any realistic uh, handgun threat, not rifles, obviously. You're going to have more weight for a rifle plate, but that is not a bad thing to have. And one thing about a bag like that, one of the reasons I really love a sling bag, if you're all of a sudden in a situation, that sling bag can be brought to your front and it gives you coverage that is similar to actually wearing a vest. Yeah. So it's, it's a real advantage should, should you need it. And it adds so little weight to the pack that to me, it's a no brainer. Um, so yeah. there's, there's all those kind of things. That pack, that, that body armor check your laws, but a lot of times it can go to places where you have to be disarmed because of the environment you could at least likely have body armor in your pack now that's a good point as well as other maybe non-lethal forms of Mm -hmm. self-defense which leads me to a to a not really a question but an observation on my end and i'm thinking yes if i have to want to blend in but i also want to blend in in such a way that I can hide stuff on me so that if I need to use it, it's not visible. So am I right in thinking that, oh, maybe I should have uh, some clothing that's a little larger than I would normally wear, especially for winter time, so that I don't print if I'm carrying concealed or if I want to carry or 
I, or if I know I have to go into an area where there's going to be a rally that could turn violent, if I want to have my, my, I have a bear spray. I actually, I have it right here. I'm not going to show it on camera because I don't want to get flagged. It's about 10 inches high. Big can of bear spray, my uh, pepper spray, or maybe one of my burner pistols or who knows, knows what, uh, a taser. I don't want to print. And in my mind, I want my clothing to be sized correctly so that I can have that stuff and I have to use it so I can quickly hide it again. But am I overthinking this? No, I don't think so. The, the good thing is in most most Western cultures, at least, if not most cultures in general, most places in the world I've been, modern men casual fashion is not tight anymore. So it's generally looser. So the good thing is you're able to lo uh, wear clothing that's fairly loose to begin with and not stand out in most environments. I, I would caution though against wearing anything that will make you stand out for example i think we had uh, the discussion about heavy clothing right how we specifically look for bad actors wearing unseasonably heavy clothing i would avoid something oh, like that right. that would specifically draw others attention to you but yeah. gen generally most of the world the uh, modern casual fashion of men especially again ladies always tend to to have it harder of course ladies also usually can carry a bag and have all kinds of great stuff in their bag right so yeah. but but generally men's fashion is looser where you can hide tools quite well yeah that's a good point point. and going back to the ladies again we, we probably need to speak more to the ladies there are a ton of of options for concealed carry for the ladies just a quick google search will reveal a lot of those options as clothing options to wear. Now, typically those like the, the yoga pants with the built-in holsters, or have you seen the flashbang bra that actually has a holster uh, in it so that they call it flashbang because you're flashing and then you bang if you have to, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually uh, a pretty novel idea as well. But those things can be covered up with heavier clothing so that you don't print and you, and you don't, or that, and that you're not obvious uh, showing that a good friend of mine owns the company Alexo Athletica, for instance, give her a little shout out, Amy Robbins, whom I've worked with in, uh, in the past and pro 2 a media, which is a great line of clothing for women. Again, you would want to wear the appropriate clothing over that to cover that up and be seasonally correct. Right. So that's what we're talking about being seasonally correct. So you don't stand out if you're wearing a big, heavy, you don't wear a big, heavy park in the middle of summertime, unless you're a thug getting ready to mug somebody with whatever's mm -hmm. hiding underneath that, or you're hiding whatever you've just um, stolen. So it covered a lot of things. We're not done with our discussion yet. More, more things to talk about. Previously, we were talking about our discussion, how we were going to outline this. And one thing I'd like you to speak about is hiding health and other indication of supplies. What does that mean, hiding health? What, do you, what are we hiding as far as our health? What's that mean? So if we talk about the, the gray man concept in the wake of societal upheaval or collapse, that, that can become important. Uh, during times when the when society is generally functional, it's not a big deal. But if we're looking at, which again, we know that our our uh, community of viewers here are going to pe be people who are into preparedness, right? So we don't have to feel like we're crazy talking at a dinner party to people about this, right? The, the, uh, the folks watching this get this, right? So in the wake of a, a serious collapse, your health signifies that you are most likely well well prepared with provision. For example, if everybody is generally hungry and losing weight <laughs> and you're walking around <laughs> looking well fed, that probably tells people that you're a prepper wow. who actually put away a lot of preparations, right? Yeah. Uh, if, if everybody has some kind of influenza and you don't, well, that might mean that you have medicines on hand, okay? All of those typical prepper things can give you away. Now, we're talking about worst case scenario here, right? But it's something certainly- Yeah, this is more of a social Bitter. collapse mm -hmm. scenario I, I guess we should sort of clarify that as well which is which is something obviously we need to discuss uh, throw that into the discussion as well so absolutely and that's part of the whole gray man concept absolutely. is to is to gray man your your supplies and your your resources as well we go we go back to what is the baseline of the environment right so the baseline in modern society of the environment is the general look of people in whatever given city that we're in that's the baseline during a collapse 
maps, what is that baseline going to be? It is going to be people who look very haggard and maybe sick and are probably getting thin real fast, right? Yeah. So these are things to consider. And this is where you know, a certain kind of clothing might be really what you want to consider having on hand, maybe a hoodie so that if you do have to interact with other people, you know, having your face generally covered and throwing in the uh, fake cough once in a while might be the sort of thing you want to consider. That's, in that, that's sneaky. Yeah, I love that. In that worst case scenario, <laughs> right? So, yeah. so again, in my book, it's one I'm of these. To, yes, <laughs> you don't want to be around me. I'm not feeling good. I'm, exactly. I might yeah. have. I might have one of those d diseases. And. I, I delve very deeply in a chapter in my book about this, uh, based on what we have seen actually happen, places like Venezuela, Serbia, that kind of stuff, where we've seen real collapses happen. And this is something that the survivors of those scenarios will talk about, that anything that gives away that you are supplied, you need to hide that. Right. And that is, again, just being gray man now in the worst case uh, scenario. What is the baseline? We don't want to attract attention to ourselves outside of that baseline. Another thing I would mention in regard to that is your weaponry. Weaponry mm. will become a target in itself during any kind of collapse because everybody's going to want it. Right. One of the reasons that I have been known to kind of rail against modern technical tactical training is not because I'm opposed to people doing it. I, I wish every single American owned an AR-15 and took a class in how to use it. It would be a much better society if we all did that. And you and I know that, right? And and our viewers realize that. It, it's not that I'm opposed to that, uh, but a lot of the gear that I see civilians in particular putting a lot of time and money into even during worst case scenario collapse is not going to do you much good. You're not going to walk around with a plate carrier and a battle belt on during a collapse where everybody is desperate and it's every man for themselves, right? Because what does that do? It puts a target on you immediately. There might be a need for that if now there's some kind of neighborhood defense where neighbors are banding and we're literally... Yeah, yeah I think that's an important clarification mm -hmm. because there, there may be a time and a place when Absolutely. you're with your tribe of yep. like mind, similar training, and you've uh, people like yourself and maybe people you've actually trained with that you have to do that. So that, that may... Uh, th th mm -hmm. there's appropriate time and place Absolutely. and there's appropriate time not to make yourself stick out or identify yourself as such. That's exactly right. So, so consider uh, concealment still going to rule the day. Okay. And I am uh, pulling on the experience of people from Venezuela, from uh, the Serbia area, all those kind of the Balkans, right? All these places that have gone through real collapses where you have to conceal your resources and weaponry is a resource. So just like now, the concealed pistol, I, I guarantee if we ever see a collapse like that, the concealed pistol is still going to be our number one line of go-to defense. Consider, though, what you would do with your long guns outside of that overt show of force or overt walking into a fight where we're wearing body armor and that kind of thing. Consider having a plate carrier that's low profile that can actually go on under a jacket or even a flannel shirt in warmer weather. I'm a big fan of that. Having a, And they're a, out there. Slick, I've seen yes. them. Yeah. Or having something slick that can still take plate, even rifle plates, but keep it slick. Maybe have a couple spare mags for the rifle, not everything in the kitchen sink on it, right? So you could actually put Put it under a jacket. Um, you may be in environments where you simply can't walk around with a rifle. Maybe you can have the rifle in a vehicle or in, in some kind of luggage, right, to keep it out of sight, out of mind, but yeah. still have it close by. So these are the things that people should put some extra consideration into. What does that post-collapse look like? I encourage people to do some research on uh, the, the writings of Selco, and there's a few others as well who have written books about these things, what they've gone through in the Balkans what they went through in Venezuela, et cetera. It's very eye-opening. And one thing you will find is that hordes of bike gangs attacking homesteads is not typically what happens. What does happen is the criminal element that is already there is unleashed with mm. no consequences. And you also get just regular people get desperate. What is a regular person who, have, who has never committed an act of violence? What are they willing to do if their children are starving, right? So those are the kind of things you want to bear in mind. So the gray man, as it applies to that worst case scenario, is still living according to the baseline, not 
standing out. If everybody else looks sick, you want to look sick. If everybody else is uh, looking weak and dirty, look weak and dirty, even if you're living well because you prepared. Really interesting. And uh, during this discussion, my mind is kind of flashing back to a meme or uh, a video or something that our, uh, you may remember this, our survival dispatch uh, crew was sharing around of some guys with a <laughs> gray man to the extreme, literally like a homeless person, literally like camouflaging with trash so as, as if you're trying to, to blend in with uh, the salvage yard or uh, the, the, the trash place. And it really depends. So there's so many different categories and concepts, really, when it comes to gray man, isn't there? There's domestic, there's international, there's uh, gray man during social collapse, gray, gray man for, for women, maybe a little different for men, and obviously different from country to country mm -hmm. and in each scenario. And one of the references you made to your book, I want to remind our viewers, uh, Sal's amazing book. It's on Amazon.com. We'll put a link, 21st Century Minute Man, uh, talking about uh, self-reliance. Uh, speak to that book a little bit uh, while we got you here, Sal. So. So in particular to the gray man, I, I have a particular chapter in the book that goes extensively into this. Again, uh, talking about experiences of other locations that have gone through collapse and talking just more in general, even when society is stable, all of these principles that we've talked about. So the book I wrote as an overall manual of preparedness, it covers a lot of ground. We've talked about some themes previously now on, on that. Uh, there's a lot of information on the active shooter threat and that kind of thing in the book. But it's a, just the overall gamut of preparation. And the gray man principle is is very important to to that whether we're talking about just around your your hometown while everything is stable or if we're talking about traveling domestically internationally or even in the wake of social collapse it's a principle that does not go away um, it is literally camouflage among the openly visible right so it's it's a very important theme with, with that said uh, you mentioned before dull colors and that kind of stuff with clothing this is something also to consider for example again most of us as any kind of preppers we keep like a get home bag in the vehicle right yep. if you had yep. to walk home now that is where you may definitely want to consider if you are far from home and have to walk home are you walking through urban environments or might you be walking through the woods i would suggest having something that lets you disappear in the woods pretty quickly regardless that's a great point i i was just thinking about that while you're you started this little tangent uh, about having some camouflage handy i think that's a very good point as well because uh you may have to to be a gray a gray man in the woods which equals camouflage as well mm -hmm. very very good point on, on that uh all of the things we've made references to today as far as sal's articles his uh the things he's published we'll put links uh, in there and as viewers we want to know what you guys think about this did we cover it pretty good what did we leave out we can't cover everything in 45 minutes there are other things we want to know what you've learned from uh sal and, uh, and myself here today mostly from sal as our expert uh what you've learned that you didn't know what considerations that you hadn't considered before, but also what would you like to see more discussion about? Make sure you put those in the comments. We will read the comments. So if we see an emphasis on a certain topic, we're more than happy to come back and address that again. Sal, going to give you 30 seconds to kind of sum up Becoming a gray man, the important points and things to think about. It, it all depends on the environment. You want to blend into what is referred to as the baseline, the normal, right? Do not be an anomaly in the environment. Do not draw attention. You mentioned earlier, Denny, and we didn't uh, have time to get into it much. You, you talked about behavior. Uh, and and just, just to hit on that, because that is an important point. So it's not just looking the part and, and dressing similar to people in the environment. Know what the behavior is like in any given place that you are. So there are certain norms and cultural traditions that may be very different. You don't want to stand out dramatically. For example, if you're among a culture that some cultures uh, invade personal space more, Western culture, like That's there's right. a certain distance where we talk to each other. So if you're in a culture that gets closer when they talk, don't hesitate to do that, right? Don't stand out yeah. as the obvious Westerner who wants to stay away from people. Just those kind of things. I, it, a lot of it is just common sense. 
sense. You don't want to make scenes where you go. You don't want to get drunk and loud. Obviously, that's a great way to get yourself robbed or killed yeah. in any location, right? But just know those traditions and and be willing to embrace the cultural differences where you are so that you don't attract attention to yourself. You might be a totally different skin color than most of the locals, but if you embrace the tradition, what does that say? That says this is somebody who's familiar, maybe somebody who lives here. This is not just uh, a tourist with their head in the clouds. What a great discussion we had today. Becoming a gray man, all sorts of different situations domestically, internationally, during social collapse. Again, let's hear what you think about this, guys. We really appreciate you watching. We want to remind you that we have certain content that YouTube hates and that you can view by becoming a Survival Dispatch Insider. Uh, we'll have the link for that as well to check out all our exclusive content. A big thanks to Sal de Janeiro, our uh, self-defense and concealed carry expert. More to come. Drop those comments. We'll read them. We'll get back to you guys. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there. <laughs>